going on guys? It is a very chilly day here in New Bern, North Carolina, and we are going to check out a Niad 370. Now, we already saw the Pacific Seacraft 37 and found that to be too small. So we're gonna see if any other 37s out there might fit the bill, so let's check it out. Before jumping in, let's hear some advice from professional sailor and author, John Kretschmer. Today's boat is a really cool one, the Niad 370. It's totally different from the other boats you've been looking at, but it's a really good boat and it's a boat that I actually like a lot. It's built in Sweden. The overall quality of the Swedish boats is just super high. It's an aesthetic that you either like or you don't. Um, it doesn't have the drama of a Taiwan built boat like the Tayana, the beautiful, stunning joiner work. Um, it doesn't, they don't have sweeping shear lines. They're very Scandinavian. They're utilitarian, they are functional, and they're really user-friendly. Trademark Niad features are a fixed dodger or fixed windscreen. Almost always they have teak decks. They're new teak in that they're, they're not fastened with screws. At the same time, teak decks are always going to be a maintenance issue at some point. They look beautiful and they're great non-skid offshore, no denying it, but they're something that play in the back of your mind. The design of the boat is kind of classic modern, if you will. It's a um, fine entry. It's got a relatively good amount of freeboard, which is why it gets a uh, why it has a lot of volume inside for its length, and it carries its beam relatively far aft. The whole shape itself of the 370, I like it because it kind of predates the move toward a flatter bottom. Um, it's a fin keel, full skeg hung rudder. And it's definitely an ocean-going boat. I mean, Nyad's mission was really, really clear. They wanted to build boats you could sail around the world. Just look at Jeannie Socrates, the oldest woman to sail single-handed nonstop around the world, and she did it in a Nyad 380. So they're really good boats. My feeling is, ultimately, though, that it's just going to seem too small. First thing I noticed about this boat was that it looked a little more boxy on deck than most of the other boats we've seen, but I didn't mind it. I love the hard dodger with built-in glass because I like the idea of not having to baby strata glass for years to come. This was also the first center cockpit boat that we've looked at, and I really liked how protected the cockpit felt. I immediately fell in love with the interior of this boat. To me, it was unassuming, but beautiful. It was neat, practical, and cozy, and it just felt like home. I couldn't believe I was on a 37-foot boat that had two cabins, a huge main salon, and a separate shower stall. How the heck did they fit everything so elegantly into this small boat? So this galley is super cute and cozy. It's me sized, we'll say. It's not really like Jordan sized. <laughs> so to get back to the refrigerator, you kind of got to hunch over. Um, that being said, the refrigerator is huge. And as far as my dedicated counter space uh, without anything underneath it that I'd need to get to, this would be a big compromise. I can do some prep work here, but you can see my head's kind of touching this. Um, so I'd probably be hunched over a lot, which you know, eventually would probably get pretty uncomfortable. So if this were our boat, I'd probably end up doing a lot of my prep work uh, at the sink right here, which isn't too bad because this boat has two sinks. As far as storage space in the galley, I'm super impressed. There's so much room back here uh, to put pots and pans and plates um, and provisions. This compartment back here is absolutely huge. And then right next to the sink over here, there's another ginormous storage space. So as far as the storage in this little galley, it's pretty awesome. I have a really hard time judging boats based on suiting me as such a tall person. Um, but I will say that this boat would be tight for me. For getting into the refrigerator, that's not so easy for me. And if I have to find something that's like way in there and not easy to get, I'm gonna be here for a little while, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> 
So this is the little miniature walkway to the aft cabin and I really like it because I'm just a weirdo and I like small spaces. So I feel real snug and it's nice that I can actually fit back here. But for Jordan coming through here, he's got really big shoulders and he's really tall. So coming back here every time is kind of pain in the butt. <laughs> but once you're in here, I really like it back here because it feels like I've got my own little domain. It's so cozy. But I do like that this aft cabin is totally separated from the rest of the boat. So I can close this door here and just kind of be in my own little nook. And actually Jordan can definitely sit up straight here. He's definitely not going to be standing. This is definitely me sized again. <laughs> Another super impressive feature of this boat is the storage space. It's unbelievable how much stuff we could fit onto this boat. For example, here's one kind of hanging locker that extends all the way back that way. And the head is also super practical because it's at the bottom of the companionway stairs. So if we're underway, I just have to climb down here and boom, I'm in the bathroom. Whereas a lot of boats, you have to make your way all the way forward. And if you're trying to do that and the boat's moving, it can be pretty difficult and kind of makes you not want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's really spacious. It is a wet head though. So every time I shower, I kind of get everything a little bit damp. And it's got this really nice liner around the bottom portion. So if you wanted to take a shower here, which it's designed to do, you wouldn't be getting a lot of moisture in your wood, which I really like. And I, I like the liner because it makes it easy to keep clean also. Because I feel like no matter how well you design a bathroom that has plywood all the way down to the floor and then wood on the floor, you're going to have moisture problems. You're going to have wood damage over the long term. With this design, I don't think that that would be a problem. And it's little things like that that make a boat age well. As for this main salon, I really like how it was designed. It's not a big space, but at the same time, it's really everything that you need. You could easily sit I mean, very easily sit three people over here for dinner and then another two, and that's comfortable. You could push it by adding even more people. This part of the table comes up and you can see that's massive. The other thing I like about it is the settees are relatively large, so they have a somewhat narrow walkway here, but I never really feel like you need much walkway space on boats. In fact, it can almost be a negative, like a downside. If you're underway and trying to move about the boat and you have a large amount of space, that's a lot of space where you can fall and kind of hurt yourself. Here you can kind of, as you're walking, lean against the table or lean against the settee. So to me, the proportions are just perfect. As for the nav station, if you were to use this for navigating while underway, this would be perfect, I think. I mean, I think it's totally adequate for sitting here and dealing with something for 30 minutes at a time. Without the backrest, it wouldn't make such a good office or workspace where we would work on our computer for hours at a time. This would be one of the major compromises for us if we were to go with this boat. So right behind me is the V-berth, but then there's a little door here, which opens up to like this secret little shower. So the current owners have converted this shower into a storage space, which is pretty awesome and convenient. You could fit a lot of stuff and provisions here. Um, I think if we bought this boat, I'd actually like to convert it back into the shower because I do like the idea of showering separately from the head so that every time I take a shower, I don't get the bathroom and the toilet all wet. So again, this boat is definitely me sized. Jordan barely fits in here. He's like a big bear in a small little area. Imagine if I were trying to shower in here, <laughs> I barely have room to hold a shower head and like move it around my body. So for someone like Desiree, I think this would work. For someone like me, it's pretty tight. Okay, so this is the V-Birth, and I don't know, there's something about the design and the aesthetic of this boat that I'm just in love with. I think it's because I'm kind of like a, the opposite of a claustrophobe, like I really like snug, cozy spaces. And to me, this V-Birth is beautiful and really cozy, but also spacious. And for kids, I think it's perfect because they'd have this door, so they'd really have their privacy and their own space on the boat. 
Um, and then if we had two kids, they could share this cabin uh, without feeling too cramped. It's definitely one of my favorite V-Bursts that I've seen so far. So right here next to this bookcase is where one of the chain plates goes through the deck. The chain plates are all attached to fiberglass knees that are glass to the hull. And what's amazing about that is it's a rot proof system. It's going to increase the longevity of the boat. You, decades and decades later, you're never going to have structural problems from water leaking through the hull. Um, you could get coring problems because the water would leak into the deck core. That's always an issue, but you're not going to have structural problems down here. As for engine access, I really like it a lot. You can get to most of the engine from back here. There's also a really large access from inside of this hallway that goes to the aft cabin. And so you can very easily get to any part of this engine. What I really like about it is that there's a lot of space. What's a real bummer is when boats have like a engine compartment that's just a little bit bigger than the engine itself and you find yourself having to like wrap your arms around everything. With this arrangement, you could get to every single part of the engine and probably like find a fairly comfortable position while you're doing it. And as for ventilation on this boat, you can kind of tell that it's optimized for sailing in colder climates. And you can see that because here in the main cabin, there's four big windows that don't open. That's because these boats, the Naiads, are designed and built in Scandinavia and designed to sail in those areas. So for the tropics, this boat might not be ideally suited. I loved the interior of this boat. I'm so impressed by how much it accomplishes in just 37 feet. But the nav station wouldn't be ideal for our needs and the ventilation isn't really optimized for the tropics. If Jordan got some corrective height surgery and we didn't work on computers all day, I'd give this boat a four out of five stars for livability. But since that's not gonna happen anytime soon, given our priorities, I'm gonna have to give it three out of five stars. All right, so first off with the cockpit, what I like about it is I feel like I would feel really secure offshore in this cockpit. The combing is substantial. There's really good protection with the Dodger. Um, I can definitely single hand this boat. So I've got the winches for both of the head sails. So it's a Solent rig. So we've got the big Genoa here and then the slightly smaller jib here. But the smallness would be a problem for me. I can't quite stand up underneath the bimini. Also, the bimini doesn't extend very far aft because of the main sheet location. It's right here behind me. And so the bimini is actually a little bit forward of my head right here. So if it were raining right now, or if like in this instance, the sun is a little bit behind us, I'm in the elements still while behind the, the wheel. And I will say that a lot of my problem with this Bimini is the fact that I'm really tall. I think Desiree fits just fine under here. I think most people, or at least a lot of people, would fit just fine under here. Now, although in the after part of the cockpit at the helm, it's not totally protected, right up here under the Dodger, I think is really, really nice and protected. I even like how the combing kind of curves into the cabin top, so that I've got like a nice backrest here. The windshield up here is a neat feature. It's made out of actual glass so that you have an unobstructed or unobscured view as you look around. When you make a Dodger out of Isinglass, there's always some waviness to it that really kind of distorts what you're seeing. So this is really nice. It's like looking through a car windshield. Also, it's super robust and strong. So that, I mean, I, I would feel really secure and confident about this arrangement in a storm. Um, the downside though, is that there's no easy way to open it up to let breeze into the cockpit. So like in the tropics, when you do want some protection from rain and sun, you want to let the breeze through. And so the ability to open up a portion of the Dodger to let air into the cockpit is really vital. And so this whole arrangement is really something that's designed for higher latitudes. So one unique thing about center cockpit boats is that they have this aft deck here and it can be kind of awkward, you know, like what exactly are you supposed to do with it? 
One thing that I like about it is that it gives you an area where you can come out of the water and then rinse yourself off without getting the cockpit wet. And that would be really nice. This boat does have a little swim step, but because of the wind vane, it's a little bit of an awkward swim step. So it works, like you could definitely use it to get up out of the water, but it's not exactly like a place that you would hang out at all. You also have the opportunity to put up a lot of solar, you know, you could put radar, all kinds of different stuff. And that's what they've done to this Naiad. And I like that quite a bit. So this boat, first of all, it doesn't have those granny bars, but that's because it doesn't really need them. You can see I'm pretty much encased by the shrouds and I don't actually have to stand on the cabin top in order to handle all the lines and to reef the main. And so I, I do feel safe here. None of the lines at the mast are led aft. And like I've said before, I, I like that. I, I don't have enough experience to really say which is better, but I will say that in my experience, having all the lines at the mast means that you can reef the main like quickly and efficiently. It's not this sort of divided system. So yeah, I think that this is a good, you know, offshore reefing platform. And then they've got the uh, pole here, the whisker pole, that's going up a track on the mast so it's ready to be deployed, really easy to use, which is great because when you're doing downwind sailing, you use the pole more if it's easy to deploy. And so I really like this setup. Probably one of my favorite aspects about this boat is how easy I feel like it would be to sail. Um, a cutter rig is definitely, you know, my favorite for offshore when the winds really get strong. But for general purpose sailing, I think a Solent rig is probably my favorite. And the reason is because you can have two relatively large sails. You can have one real big one for light wind sailing, and you can have one that's just moderately sized and that you can still reef to make it even smaller. It just makes it so that the boat can sail optimally in more wind conditions, and you can do it very conveniently all from the cockpit, just using the furling lines and the sheets. Um, also, the boat doesn't need running backstays, which is a huge plus. And then finally, it gives you more foredeck area than you'd have on a cutter to stow like a dinghy. I think this Naiad is a badass blue water boat. It'd be easy to sail, safe offshore, and capable in a variety of wind conditions. If I were an average height human being, I'd easily give this boat five out of five stars. But because I'd be unable to stand up straight in the cockpit, and because of the slightly exposed helm station, I've personally gotta give it four out of five stars for sailability. So the first thing that I noticed when looking at the Naiad 370 is that it has a relatively deep fin keel and fine entry on the forward part of the hull. This means that the boat should sail pretty well to windward. The boat also has a relatively high ballast to displacement ratio, which means that it should be a relatively stiff boat or that it won't really heal all that much when sailing to windward, which is great. Also, the boat is relatively heavy for its length, which will translate into a more comfortable motion when offshore. But one downside that I see here is a pretty low sail area to displacement ratio, meaning that the boat probably won't sail all that well in light winds. So all in all, what I see here is a boat that's designed to optimize safety and comfort offshore in moderate to heavy conditions, but does so at the expense of light air performance, as well as the ability to cruise in shallow water. As we've mentioned already, this boat would be absolutely perfect for high latitude sailing, but our ideal boat would perform a little better in light winds. So I'm going to give this boat four out of five stars. Now let's hear from our broker, Bernie Jackets. Anything that is built in Scandinavia, and I'm talking about from Denmark to the Netherlands, to Finland, to the Baltics, to you know, Sweden, they turn out incredible boats because of the history of the Vikings being there and the climate and extremely skilled, skilled workforce. Holberg Rassi, Marlow, Najad, 
uh, they all use the same exact uh, building processes. That probably one guy works at one factory one weekend, then he goes to the next factory. The 3700, I think that they're great sailing boats. The construction is great. Uh, the only issue is that basically you do have the Volvo engines and they are a little bit more complex to maintain than a Westerbeek or a Yanmar naturally. Okay, that's number one. The teak decks on these boats, if you're looking at one that was built in 19, you know, eight, mid 80s, you know, to the 1995s, uh, the teak decks is gonna be an issue. Uh, they are screwed in in certain places, okay? Uh, and they definitely need to be pulled up and you're gonna have core damage. But overall, I think it's a powerful sailing boat. It's a commodious boat because it gives you that air state room. You can get a really good one at from 65, 75,000 all the way to more like 125, 130. You know, it's one of those boats that basically if you have a limited budget and you want a nice, commodious, beautiful looking boat, I think it's a great choice. So this is such a cool boat. I really, really loved it and it checks a lot of our boxes. It's definitely the kind of boat where we would sail more and work on the boat less based on its condition and maintainability. And it seems to really prioritize comfort at sea versus comfort at anchor. Now, as far as being big enough to fit our family over the next 10 years comfortably, it doesn't quite check that box because it doesn't even really fit Jordan yet. <laughs> yeah, it might do okay for a family of four if they were all not as tall as me or even like relatively short people, it could be perfect. But we like this boat so much that we would be really interested in seeing more Nyads, Halberg Rossies, Malos, any of the Swedish build sailboats. There's a couple reasons why we're not able to find many on the market that we're particularly interested in. First of all, not very many of them fit that range between price and age that we're looking at. Um, a lot of them are more expensive than we'd like. A lot of them are older than we'd like. Uh, the other thing is not very many of them are available in the United States. Uh, there's just very few that make their way over to the States and then get put on the market. And then finally, a lot of these designs incorporate either spade rudders or partial skeg rudders, which I'm just not so interested in that. I just know we're gonna run aground one day and we're gonna run aground hard. <laughs> and so I wanna be able to like for sure survive that experience. So we're only really considering full skeg rudders and that kind of limits our boat choices when it comes to Scandinavian designs. But if we're not able to pick a boat that's available in the United States, then we very well may start to look in Europe and there we would find a lot of Nyads, a lot of Hallberg Rossies and Malos for sale there. So that is a possibility. I do think the main takeaway that we learned from this boat is that for the price, this boat is awesome. I mean, it can take you anywhere. It's super safe. It's really comfortable. And so if you're just able to sacrifice on the size and a little bit of space on the interior, you're going to be getting an amazing boat at a really, really great price. So that's definitely something to consider. But for us, we're just a little bit too tall for this boat. So the boat hunt continues. Join us next week. We're going to be going over to Annapolis, Maryland, and we're going to be checking out a Valiant 42. Hope to see you guys then. to take a minute to thank some of our newest patrons. Uh, we are actually super behind on patron shout outs, so we are so sorry. It's been a hectic couple of months ever since we found out about the bulkhead on Atticus, and we're gonna have to do things a little bit differently, so thank you so much for your patience. So thank you so much to our newest First Mate level patrons, Christopher Michael Chandler, Enrique Thayer, Nicole Ferretti, Terry Williamson, Chris Howard, and Dan and Bridget Marcuz. And huge thanks to our newest Bosun level patrons, Blake Rayner Buddington, Yuri Vaxelis, what's up Yuri? David Wood, Steve Irwin, and Corey Beacom. And a huge thank you to our newest Yachtmaster level patrons, Dan Hartman, Shane Wood, Justin Chatwin, Bernd Magnussen, Dominique Moraglia, Alex Ilgen, Carrie Greenfield, Steve and Joe Hubbard, and Vivian and Phil Pitts. And finally, thank you to our newest Deccan level patrons, Stacey DePaolo, Jonathan Connick, Garth Barrier. Pronounce names.com. Barrier. Barrier. Garth Barrier, Ron Brock, Ken Phelps, Diane Blakely, Ruth Holt, Don Morrow, 
Stephen Brooks, Jacob Sleva, Pam and Kirk Warren, Peter Schaefer, Ruth and Tyler Tate, Robert Scranton, Dave and Jess, Joanne and Jerry Hamilton, Colin Barker, John and Linda Latronica, Douglas Green, Corey Hill, Rodney Waugh, Brian Silliman, Bonnie Lynn, Alfredo Mora, and Andrew Dottridge. Thank you guys so much for all of your love and encouragement. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to put nearly as much time, love, and energy into each and every one of these videos. So thank you so, so much, and we'll catch you next week.